Welcome to episode 38. A week ago, a sermon clip from a prominent pastor was shared widely on social media. In it, the pastor had some pointed things to say about those talking about unhealthy churches and Christian leaders. Is speaking up like I'm doing here dogging on the church? Janai Amen, writer and advocate for spiritual abuse survivors, joins me for this conversation, and later in this episode, author Mary DeMuth shares about her new book, The Most Misunderstood Women of the Bible. All of this is in today's episode. I am so glad you're here. I'm not talking about toxic, abusive wickedness. That there is something like that that needs to be exposed, and people need to be removed, and people, but man, not in this for money or power. He's trying to love God's people and, and the sheep bite, man. But we don't, we don't talk about it. the sheep don't bite. They're all just, you know, abused by power hungry. It's ridiculous. I just hate that the, the general rhetoric against those who are vocalizing wounds is to talk about the wounded as if they've left the church because they don't love Jesus anymore. This is Amy Fritz, and you're listening to Untangled Faith, a podcast for anyone who has found themselves confused or disillusioned in their faith journey. If you want to hold on to your faith while untangling it from all the things that are not good and true, this is the place for you. Last week on social media, there was a portion of a sermon clip from a prominent pastor that was widely shared. I listened to the clip. And to say that it was frustrating and heartbreaking is putting it mildly. I'm going to share a portion of that as a way to provide context for this episode, because this was the impetus for my conversation with Janai Amen. Due to the fact that the overarching theme of this episode is being misunderstood, I want to point out that I found the sermon and listened to much of it because I wanted to make sure these isolated clips weren't taken out of context. I'll have a link to that in the show notes for anyone who might be interested. Okay. Here's that portion of that sermon that inspired my conversation with Janai. One of the things that I hear often and I see quite frequently uh, as, as a, a reason for bailing on the faith is the hypocrisy and, and, um, and, and whatever of Christians. Now, I, I want to acknowledge church hurt and betrayal is a real thing, but that is the most self-righteous pronouncement I think a person can say. Are you serious? Like, I, I, like the disciples don't bail on Jesus because of Judas. They got their eyes on Jesus. They're, they're blown away by Jesus. They're not looking around going, oh man, all these people were following him. And man, look at that, they're inconsistent. You're inconsistent. I'm inconsistent. This is the only community there is that celebrates the fact that we're all in process. Like nobody's there yet. Like to demand that you get grace and nobody else is, is self-righteousness. And to punt on Jesus because some Christian, you know, isn't up to your standards is a dangerous place to stand before a living God. Here's my conversation with Janai Amen. There's some things happening in the world of, I would say, misrepresenting people that have experienced hurt at the hands of faith communities and uh, faith leaders. Well, first of all, tell me what you're doing. Tell me about the Wilderness Forum and how you got there and why why you were interested in this to begin with. I mean, obviously, we're, we're talking about Acts 29, and I was in the Acts 29 network or within an Acts 29 church for 11 years. So like the entirety of my 20s and the idea of community is so ingrained and it's I, I believe in community. It is so ingrained in the overall message and vision of Acts 29 and I lived it and I just breathed it. And I and I, I think as an Enneagram too, like it just it like clicked for me that, yes, like the community thing, I get it. That's in my blood. Mm-hmm. Um, but then when you're either walking through church hurt or whether you're ready to call church hurt spiritual abuse or religious trauma, and you realize that kind of shatters the entire community and support system you have, and you're left just wandering alone. And I was really trying to come to terms with my story. In the beginning, I called it church hurt, and then I realized I was finding more language just by 
reading or listening to more stories or connecting with other people. And I just thought, I wish there was like a place that I could go to ask questions in safety Mm -hmm. without blowing the lid on everything. And obviously there wasn't a place, there wasn't like a, I mean, I guess you could go and ask questions somewhere anonymously, but I really wanted to know who I was receiving wisdom from. Yeah. And ultimately what I did do was I just kind of shared my story publicly. And then from that, I realized what I wanted in finding other people, they were finding in me. And so we were mutually connecting over messages in Twitter and Instagram. And um, really what I, I kept thinking over and over again was, what if there was a place that we could engage? Like, I just wish I could bring these two people together because I think that they would be friends. Um, but I, I couldn't really do that. Yeah. I mean, I guess I could have, but I, I, I wanted to create a space where it was safe. And so I created the Wilderness Forum. And it's been just kind of like a, a small little community we, where we can ask questions, ask the questions that are often not welcome in other spaces. But really, it was just my heart for people who were hurt and wounded and letting them know that they weren't alone. That kind of drew, drove me to do what I'm doing today and kind of creating community, but also caring for people. We have a similar personality. I am very um, energized by connecting people and helping people. And so the fact that you're doing this is, is it just, it warms my heart. It gets me super excited. And also what you said about being drawn to something because of like what we wanted so much as this community where we could show up and be known and loved. And when you show up and you figure out that part of you isn't completely welcome. It's, it's shattering, especially when your community is so much tied up in one particular place. Yeah. When it works, it's beautiful, but when it doesn't, it is so isolating. So to provide a place for people to kind of work through that is, is beautiful. Janai and I talked about how we found ourselves in this space of speaking about spiritual abuse, hurt, and harm in the church. For me, it was listening to a survivor of the wreckage at Harvest Bible Chapel lament that those who left previously had never said anything when they left, and how they so wished those folks would have explained their exit. That was when I knew I was going to have to make a choice that would cost me something. I think I knew then I'm going to have to say something. I'm a say something person, that feeling of like, oh boy, I know this is my desire to be safe and welcome in a community of people that I have looked up to and admired. I'm going to jeopardize that. Yeah. Oh, Uh, yeah. I'd love to talk about the way we are seeing not all leaders, but some very prominent leaders and their apologists talk about and write articles and write tweets and preach sermons that seems very defensive of the church. They, they, it seems like they feel like the community of people that are speaking up about hurt is like attacking the church or some sort of danger yeah. uh, to them. It's institutional protection, like yeah. in the most general and sem- simple terms. And that's not something that's only isolated, obviously, to the church. We see that, you know, corporately and in yeah. the private sector. I mean, we see it in so many places. It's just weird to see it in the church because you would assume or just guess just in the ways, in the things that we communicate that we believe in that we should be a disarmed people um, Mm -hmm. because Christ is the one who we are following and he bore the weight of everything that we should have borne. And so to follow him, we're going to suffer and we're going to endure these awful things. And so, you know, on the cross, Jesus didn't protect himself. And, and, And so the, the institutional protection for me is so strange, but what's so hurtful about, you know, the ways in which people continue to ostracize people who vocalize their wounds is they talk about the wounded as if they're no longer a part of the church. Yeah. And it breaks my heart because so many of those wounded people desperately want to know like if Jesus still loves them or if Jesus is still for them if they're if they're allowed at the table anymore um and I 
the things that I do and the work that I do is really to tell them, yes, like you are welcome to the table. Yeah. Because the traditional spaces may have ostracized you or scapegoated you or pushed you out in some way, shape, or form, the church is far more big, it, bigger and more vibrant and beautiful than just this one local context. And Christ is obviously bigger and more beautiful than anything that we can ever imagine. And so that's really like my heart is for them. I just hate that the the general rhetoric against those who are vocalizing wounds is to talk about the wounded as if they've left the church because they don't love Jesus anymore. And I don't think that that is generally true. Or that they are some sort of a threat. That is the thing that is so, so hard. When we talk about being misunderstood, this podcast is a gift for those who have felt misunderstood to kind of hear us process this and to say, we get you and we know that it's hard. You know, there's a narrative that says we're saying it's all bad Mm -hmm. and that there's some sort of slippery slope into whatever it is and saying that those who are speaking up are doing it because they're like, profiting in some way, like it's making their life better. I would love to hear you speak to that because I was just thinking last night, I was in a really dark place. I would give anything. I would I would give anything to be in a world where I didn't have to be connected. My name did not have to be connected to this. This is not my dream. Like I'm going to grow up and I'm going to be the person that talks about things that are really hard and painful about faith and something that has been like, that is the most important part of my life has contributed to the worst pain of my life. I didn't choose this. It's so I'm a part of a few writing groups and it's usually Christian writers. And so we all kind of write about different topics and my particular, I guess if we want to use the word platform, that's fine. Like Instagram, it has, my account's grown. I think a lot of people are wondering, you know, how do you engage with your people? How do you, how are you engaging with them in such a way that they keep coming back and they keep reading your words and as a writer and how do they, uh, and I thought, you know what? I don't know. I think I'm, I'm just writing what I know and what I know is awful. And the fact that other people, can resonate with what I write is heartbreaking. And I I remember telling one of them, you know, like some days it's just so hard, like writing on the things that I do takes a physical toll on my body in such a way that like sometimes I'll send something and I know that it's going to resonate with so many people and I'll just cry. And I don't Mm want to cry. I don't want to be upset. I don't want to, I don't want this to be the thing that I'm writing about. And I don't want this to be the thing that I'm championing, championing for. Um, you know, at the end of the day, this was plan B. Plan mm-hmm. A was loving the people in my local neighborhood and in my local congregation really well until the day that I died. And like I uh, just spoke to some people yesterday, like I thought I was, you know, just go- going to be there and like my funeral was going to happen within the building. Like I thought that that was going to happen within mm-hmm. our old church. And so the fact that I'm here, like even this morning, I woke up and thought, man, we, there was someone I thought, I was like, I just thought of something really funny on on a walk this morning. And I thought, oh, I need to send it to this person. But I realized I'm not in relationship with that person anymore because they are still at that church and they've chosen to believe that I was a threat to whatever they were building. I know my personality and I, I know I don't come off as like a, hey, let's let's go fight. So part of me is like, what am I threatening? And what what is what about my message is threatening? And I think there are times I'm so angry and I start raging and I realize those are the moments I need for me to process through whatever. And sometimes that's just in the shower, just being frustrated or it's in the car, just kind of angry monologuing to myself to kind of process emotions. But anytime I approach my writing spaces or anything that I communicate through to other people on social media, I try to say like, hey, Jesus is a gentle shepherd and he draws near to you. Like that is kind of the heartbeat of my work because if I default into arrogance or an unshakable pride that starts dehumanizing people, then I become the very thing that ended up wounding me. And so I wish this wasn't a conversation we needed to have. Yeah, I don't want to talk about this, but I want to talk about it because 
um, particularly with the movement that I came out of, the church planting movement and going and reaching these unreached people groups and, you know, engaging with these zip codes that don't have a church in them or whatever. Part of me is like, yes, we need to do that. But what are we saving them into? Like, what are they coming into? And will they eventually need to be saved from it? The aim of my work is to say, like, let's keep the church beautiful. And I just don't know what is threatening about that unless there are particular ideas of what a church or a local church is or who a pastor is or what a shepherd is. And I'm challenging that idea. Then, yes, I may be a threat to some people because Mm -hmm. there's something that they hold to that is so highly revered. And I'm saying that's not the way of Christ. From another optic, it would assume because I'm threatening a particular vision of the church, it does look like I'm tearing something apart. And there's so many things that are connected in the, you know, like Sky Jatani called it the evangelical industrial complex, right? Yes. So of course, like pulling at one thread when so many things are connected, makes a lot of those interconnected things kind of close ranks and Mm -hmm. and not want to see it because it will cost something. If our systems are unhealthy and we need to look at them and change how it is, it's going to mean that certain income generating things aren't going to generate as much income. It's going to mean that certain jobs that were created from for these things to support some of these unhealthy systems aren't going to be necessary anymore. You know, that's scary. And, you know, my response to that is to say, you know, Jesus does not need an unhealthy system to take care of somebody. (laughs) He doesn't need to have that in place so much that he would be like, you know, we're not going to touch that because what if we can't serve the poor in that community anymore? What if people don't come to Christ anymore? Because, Mm -hmm that leader was exposed for who they were, or there was some accountability. Don't we serve a God that is bigger than that? Yeah. I believe we do. We don't need to hide the truth in order to protect the church. I mean, what we see now is a lot of like, you know, narrative spinning, or we see part of the truth is communicated, but not the full truth. And like, just for instance, I was terminated from my job at my church and the truth communicated out to the church was that I was going back to school. And that was not the truth. Mm -hmm. And I realized it was a palatable truth. It was something that was digestible and it, it didn't raise any flags to those who were wondering what's going on because Janai's been at this church for 11 years. Why would she just leave? a staff position. And I realized like long after the fact, I started telling people, no, that's not the reason I left. And I started saying like any truth that we communicate now should revere and point to the greatest truth. But what we're doing is we're spinning the narrative and we're telling a story that perpetuates an agenda. And if that agenda doesn't look like Jesus, then like we're not communicating the truth. We're communicating falsehood. And it, yeah. it's damaging because then you you start breaking away at trust. Really, it's not the people who are blowing the whistle or bringing accusations to light who are ruining anything. It's the fact that their stories are true and they're, they've been kept hidden. That's what starts making the foundation of whatever system or organization that the foundation crumbles because – the truth is spoken and the truth was real and the truth was hidden. Ryan Ramsey said something. He always says some, he has the most brilliant, thoughtful things that he shares. One of the first things that he said that I have come back to so many times and he had pointed out that it was, it's so interesting that in this faith system and Christianity where we believe that everybody has a sin nature that we would not apply that also to people that run organizations and the organizations that we run. If we, if we have a sinful nature, if there's a part of us that has sin in us, which is all of us until we are, you know, until we're like dead and with Jesus and and redeemed and all things are made new again. The fact that we have such a hard time believing that our organizations run by imperfect people could also be imperfect. 
was mm-hmm. really an interesting thing that we would, that so many times we apply this unquestioning loyalty to an organization that we would never like that goes against what we actually believe when we think about it, about the fact that there is no, you know, a lot of pastors like to say the fact that there's no perfect church and there's no perfect leader. What does that mean then? That I think it means, if you follow that through to its conclusion, is that we need to be open to hearing that feedback. We need to be open to the fact that absolutely there are some things that could be wrong here Mm -hmm. and how can we see them? And that Christian faithfulness, Ryan says that Christian faithfulness and integrity looks like being willing to discern when we need to jump ship because we need fewer sinking ships. The narrative that speaking up or leaving is unfaithful is very prevalent, but it is so very wrong. Janai points out that the idea of leaving an unhealthy place that offered at least a bit of comfort isn't new. This is one of the oldest stories of God's people. I love the idea of like just the people of God exodusing from a place or they engage in an exodus. And many of them, when they're actually in the wilderness, they're like, well, at least we had food back in Egypt. Like, why (laughs) did you take us away? Um, And so the exodus was obviously hard and painful, but God calls his people to come out of oppression. It's so funny, Emily, in your previous podcast, she mentioned cognitive dissonance. I totally believe that plays a huge part Mm -hmm. in what people just can't get or can't understand with this conversation is that the people that I try to speak to are the people that are already hurt because I don't know how to minister to some, I don't know how to change their mind because that is a very, very sensitive territory because I know that I'm uprooting something within them. And maybe I don't really want to change somebody's mind so much as letting people see things themselves. Yeah. Yeah. And I, so I know that it creates a dissonance in them that they may not have ever been equipped to deal with ever in their life. Yeah. And so I am very sensitive in engaging that conversation. I am very focused on the people who have already been like shattered and demolished and who want to know how to move forward. And that's my heart is for them. I am very untrained and unknowing, but willing to learn how to engage the conversation in quelling the dissonance that comes. Like how do we hold tension? Well, I'm still learning to do that. And I hope to do more of that. Um, But I know that I can't constantly sit in tension all the time because that takes a toll on my mind and my body and my spirit. Really, what helps is knowing who I am. I've written about this a lot recently because I, for the first time in a very long time, I like myself. I like who God uh, has called and created me to be. And because I'm so steadfast in who I am today, I can engage a conversation where someone disagrees with me. Um, Maybe I have been critical about specific words a well-known pastor has said, and I know that maybe people will come to that pastor's defense. And I tell them, if he has ministered to you, Mm -hmm. that is wonderful. I just have an issue with these very specific words that he says because it lands on people very, very harshly. And it lands on an already hurt and traumatized people. And so I'm speaking to those people, the hurt people, so that these words don't land on them with the full weight they may, I mean, they can be crushing. And so some people do rise to the defense of, you know, people they revere. And I tell them like, if he, if that person or prominent figure ministers to you, that's great. I I can listen to the disagreement and know that it's really not me that they, it's something within them that I've challenged that they're trying to reconcile because I know who I am. I don't think, oh, well, I'm a terrible person because I just said something that they disagreed with. I I resonate with that because really we aren't about trying to change anybody's minds. This, the space that we are in is the, how can we encourage minister to provide community and help and healing to those that have been hurt? Tell them we hear you. Jesus doesn't look like what you have seen. So this conversation with Janai was inspired by a video clip of a sermon by a prominent pastor. A portion of this sermon was shared widely online. And when I listened, it made me sick to my stomach. This is what the pastor said as he was preaching through first Peter chapter one. He took a moment while talking about how we are to love one another with a pure heart and said that the ability to love God's people is not rooted in their likability. And that's when it appeared that he took a little detour of sorts. He talked about how people bail on their faith because of hypocrisy of Christians 
And it was clear from the words and demeanor of this pastor that he believed it was ridiculous. And then he said these words. But to demand that you get grace and nobody else is, is self-righteousness. And to punt on Jesus because some Christian, you know, isn't up to your standards is a dangerous place to stand before a living God. Later, he said, it's one of those generational moments where everywhere you look, somebody is dogging the church. Gosh, it's always been a mess. There's just social media now, but accountability isn't abuse and calling people to holiness isn't controlling. We're losing a ton of people looking at the brokenness of the church as if it's brand new. He went on to argue that pastors in the Acts 29 network weren't in it for the money or power and that these pastors are just trying to love people. And then he said this. He's trying to love God's people and, and the sheep bite, man. But we don't, we don't talk about it. the sheep don't bite. They're all just, you know, abused by power hungry. It's ridiculous. I'll put a link to the sermon in the show notes so you can listen to it in context if you want. I went back and listened to the entire thing. I have to say it didn't ease my concerns. The context still didn't make the anger and sarcasm defensiveness and mocking of those who have been hurt any better. Um, I think the thing that was really hard for me, like yesterday and, and the day before is, is like listening to these words that say, you know, everywhere you look, someone is dogging on the church and, you know, you want grace for you and you better give it to others. Like it just like, you know, a really well-known pastor is saying this. It's one thing if you only ever have people in your own personal community hearing your sermons in in that context. But this isn't the case for this person. And even if it even if it were, I would still push back a little bit on the on the anger that I was hearing and and the the words that are just so shaming. In this case, you put your words out there, you're a conference speaker. You are lead an organization that is a nationwide organization. You are an author. You, um you put your stuff out on YouTube and you know everyone's going to see it. I don't understand people saying you don't get to be uncomfortable with this person's words because you don't really know them. Yeah. You said to me is that that same grace isn't offered to those that are raising their hand and saying, I think there's some things wrong in the system. I think there's some things that are broken in the church. And then like to come back to those people and say, well, you're not being gracious. I mean, that is what's crazy making about the whole thing. And you start, you like leave a conversation like that thinking like, am I crazy? Am I the problem? Mm -hmm. Am I, and like the self gaslighting. Oh yes. Like any, anyone with a sphere of influence, technology being what it is, we have the capability to disciple people and equip people and teach people who just don't know us. Yeah. And for someone who's so well known to say things like that, it it's reckless. Yeah. It's it the reach is incalculable. Specifically to that quote that you mentioned. I mean, that pastor is in the same state as me. I, I mean, I know people know I'm all over the globe. And so yes. anywhere I go in the continental new, United States and have a conversation with people who are coming within that like sort of doctrine and denomination, like th- that's the voice that they're listening to. I mean, there's a lot of assumptions being made too. Like if I'm dogging on the church, uh, dogging is a, it's a pointed term. It's as yeah. if I don't revere and love the church because I value the beauty of the bride. I'm yeah. bringing forward concerns to keep her beautiful and to keep the cancer out. And so it's really dismissing and devaluing. I think a lot of us in this conversation have pointed to the fact that Jesus, you know, flipped tables, that whole story where he went yeah. to the money changers and flipped the tables. And I think like that was one moment in like, I'm sure was charged with emotion and compassion and care where he just looked angry. And really, I'm sure in that moment, the money changers were like, wow, that guy's so ungracious. He could have just kindly asked me to leave. But really, (laughs) like for all of those who were being taken advantage of for who knows how long, they probably thought, 
oh my gosh, someone finally stood up for us. Fin- someone finally addressed like this oppressive system where I just wanted to come and bring offerings and sacrifices to the temple. For the money changers, it was a totally ungracious act. But to those who were being oppressed, it was grace and yeah. grace that they hadn't experienced in so long. And so I almost reject the fact that those who were bringing concerns or you know, highlighting issues or issues of abuse in the church, I reject that those people are ungracious in totality. And yeah. and that that was kind of the quote, that they were ungracious in totality. This is one of the times where I'm like, do I even want to do this? I wish I didn't have to know about it. I wish our world wasn't so connected that people's words like that weren't influencing pastors in my community. Mm-hmm. I wish that wasn't the case. But listening to it, I was just like, it didn't feel like defending Jesus. It didn't feel like, it felt like you're not offering me grace. This is somebody that I have seen offer gracious sermons and offer yeah. helpful things. And I'm looking at his his Instagram, 125,000 followers. That's a huge reach. And that's just on Instagram. There are a lot of pastors that aren't on Instagram. And so you've got 125,000 there and you've got how many other thousands other places. And it makes me sad because I know that there are pastors that are like, Mm -hmm. if he says that these people must just be ungracious and attacking. A friend of this pastor later posted this, maybe spend less time casting Christians, you know, only from a distance as either hero or villain. And the end of her post said, peaceable speech is a good habit. That felt like gaslighting. Like the clip wasn't peaceable. And I feel like I'm being shamed. One of the things Janai and I struggled with in regard to this response was that it overlooked the fact that those words from the pastor weren't peaceable. And they also seem to only call out those who have spoken out about being hurt. Why not call on leaders to lead the way in being peaceable? That tweet could have been organized in such a way that like said, we need to be more peaceable people painting with a broad stroke for everyone, but that was not the ways in which it was done. And so I just thought, man, and it's all always from people I formerly used to, re- whose books are sitting on my shelves, who I, who like, I cut my teeth on their Bible studies and like, and it's just really hard feeling like I, I just want to know if I'm still welcome to the table, but for whatever yeah. reason, they keep pushing me away from the table because I'm not peaceable. And I'm like, I'm actually trying to address like a very unpeaceable system. Yeah. There's like this false peace when when people aren't speaking about the things that need to be spoken of. That's that's not actual real peace. Speaking of faux peace, I'm going to tell you like an anecdote. I was on a trip with my family and we are in Texas, which is a very red state. Um, I, I'm also biracial for anyone that doesn't realize that. I, I present very right, white, but um, mm-hmm. I have a Filipino mom. And so I'm my heart is very dear to those who have immigrated as someone who um, was raised by a mom who immigrated to the States in a, in a state that is very, has been very unkind to her. Mm-hmm. And so on this trip, someone said very, something very unkind toward, it, it was very, very, racially driven and very, very unkind. I got mad. I got mad. And I realized it it was this comment was said in a group of people. And I realized everyone knows that that racially charged comment that was kind of shrouded as a joke, everyone knows that that comment wasn't okay. But no one is going to say anything because it's going to disrupt the general feeling of peace among us. And I took my husband aside later and I said, I said that exact same thing to him. I said, no one's going to say anything because they don't want to disrupt something. But if my African-American friends and brothers and sisters were right here and they heard that comment and they saw everyone say nothing, sure, the communal peace may not have been disturbed, but that person's inner peace and their inner personhood Mm -hmm. was just demolished for the sake of keeping some faux peace. And I think, obviously, that is a racial conversation and one that I am very ill-equipped in. But I think something similar is happening within the abuse and church hurt and betrayal question. Is like, yeah, sure, we could all not say anything about 
abuse in the church or people actually being assaulted or groomed by pastors. Sure, we could not say anything and keep some sort of unity or peace, but that unity and peace would be fake because the price of that unity is being paid by all the people who have been abused, all the people who are internally destroyed because to keep this faux fake peace that everyone's enjoying, I have to be in such inner turmoil. I don't get to be a whole human being. And that is devastating. And I don't think that that is the church that Jesus wanted to cultivate. He drew near to hurting people and he had them talk about it. Even the the woman who was hemorrhaging, she didn't even want to talk to him. She just wanted to touch the fringe of his robe to be healed. She just wanted to be in his presence. And instead of just letting her be healed, he addressed her and he said, tell me about it. Let me know Mm. more. But we don't ask people to tell us about their hurts or their wounds. We ask that they be quiet so that we can still enjoy our peaceable whatever. And I just think it's a joke. In comments like that and in conversations, it just declares to all the hurt and wounded people, I can't tell those people my story. They're not safe. If anything, I will be, I will always be the villain to them. Mm. And that's yeah. so devastating. I've been thinking through how to wrap up this part of this episode. I don't want to downplay the serious concern that many of us have had with the way we've seen some pastors and leaders talk about those speaking up about abuse in the church. On the other hand, I don't want to err on the side of painting others with that wide brush that I reject being used on myself. Is there a serious problem of abusive and unhealthy leadership in many of our churches? I believe there is. Are there wonderful, kind, and healthy Christian leaders who have experienced what this pastor we spoke of today refers to as sheep bite? Yes, I know that happens. Both experiences are painful, and both are worthy of taking a serious look at to consider how to care for those who have been hurt by unhealthy and, in some cases, abusive individuals. Where I've landed in respect to the situation Janai and I discussed today is that we don't have to downplay one painful and unhealthy situation to make room to care for another one. This isn't a pain competition. One of the least helpful things we can do is misrepresent and minimize the experiences of others because what they are saying feels like a threat to us in some way. And that's what's breaking my heart in this situation. And that's what's causing me to pause. Is there room at the table for those who have been hurt to raise their hands and voices and ask for a better way without being accused of dogging the church or giving up on Jesus? Is there room for a leader to share how one of their congregation harmed them? Yes. And compassion should be offered to those who need it, not sarcasm, mocking, and anger. If you're interested in listening to the entire sermon that Janai and I referenced at the beginning of this episode, I've linked it in the show notes, and I would love to hear your thoughts on this. Before we transition to my conversation with Mary DeMuth, I want to tell you about a podcast I recently discovered, The 10-Minute Bible Hour. I would love for you to check them out. It's great for longtime believers who want a new way to engage with scripture. And it's also accessible for those who consider themselves outsiders who just want to explore the Bible's story. I especially love that this is a great space for listeners like you who are untangling and unsubscribing to the trappings of cultural Christianity while holding on to what is true. There's no agenda here. It's a daily 10 minute podcast that gives you the Bible without a sermon. You can find the 10 Minute Bible Hour anywhere you listen to podcasts, or you can find them on YouTube or at the tmbh.com. That's the tmbh.com. It's only fitting that Mary DeMuth joins me today. It's been almost a year since my very first podcast episode, and Mary was the very first person that I interviewed that I didn't know in everyday life. Mary's new book, The Most Misunderstood Women of the Bible, What Their Stories Teach Us About Thriving, comes out on April 12th this month. Mary relates the two common experiences we all have of being misheard, mischaracterized, and misunderstood with the experiences of 10 different women in the Bible. Here's my conversation with Mary. 
So I guess I want to start out by just asking, like, what made you decide to write about misunderstood women? Um, the Misunderstood Women of the Bible is the name of your book. And like, what what was it that inspired that? A couple of things, actually. So the first was a couple of years ago, I walked through a deep misunderstanding with a good friend and it just kind of threw me off. And during that interaction, I was assigned motives that weren't true, but no matter how hard I tried to explain that those motives were pure, I mean, as much as a sinner like me can have pure motives, you know, um, I couldn't convince the other person of my motives. And I realized that especially now in today's weird social media environment, we're being misunderstood all the time. And it's one of the greatest injuries that we endure as human beings. And so that was coupled with, um, over the past couple of years, I've been reading the Bible rapidly in either two month or three month segments. So I'll just read from cover to cover in two or three months. And that really helped me to look at the stories of the Bible with fresh eyes instead of just hearing a pastor's voice in my head. And I realized there's a lot of these women's stories that just were never talked about. And I, so I combined those two things and then I put on my fiction hat and uh, got to retell those stories as a novelist and then put on my nonfiction hat and said, okay, what does this mean? How did these women endure their mistreatment and their misunderstanding? And how can we learn how to navigate the valley of misunderstanding with grace and with hope and with, you know, with intention? I love that. It makes it really accessible. So it's not written as a, what was, what's the word? It's not like it, not written as a, a commentary, mm-hmm. um, but each chapter is dedicated to a different woman in the Bible. And you start out by giving a little narrative with a little bit of um, poetic license. Mm-hmm. And then you dig after sharing like their, their narrative arc. I love how you, kind of jump out of the scene a little bit and give more context. You must love Bible study to do this sort of thing. <laughs> you geek out a little bit on some of that context and and digging. I do. And it's it's really from a springs from just a love for the word of God. And and a lot of what I glean from in writing those stories is obviously the context of it in scripture and just asking really good questions. And so I do go into commentary uh, in a way um, because I definitely did research and all of that, but the lion's share of the insight that I got for each woman was just putting my feet into their sandals and asking, what if, what if this were me, how would I feel if this happened to me? And then looking at the the general context of scripture around it to make sure that it was as accurate as, as possible and um, backed up by good scholarship and as close to the biblical narrative as possible. So if there's a, you know, a conversation, then I use the exact words that are in the Bible to convey the conversation. Yeah. So if there's a quote, if there's a quotation in there, (laughs) Mm -hmm. it's actually from, it's actual dialogue that you got from a translation Mm -hmm. of the Bible. I didn't ask you this ahead of time. What's your, what are your favorite Bible translations as you are doing in your your reading? You said like your fast reads. My fast reads, uh, it's the NLT, the New Living Translation. It just reads really nicely. And I also really like the Net Bible. Um, That one is really scholarly and full of a lot of just great stuff. So yeah, the Net and the NLT. A lot of people that listen to this have experienced some sort of hurt, and I think they can probably relate to being misunderstood. What are some things that you learned as you were studying that are common misconceptions about some of these women? Well, I think, you know, this is an interesting thing I had to tackle when I was writing the book is that they were misunderstood in their context. And so we needed to look at that. But then they are also misunderstood historically. And that wasn't necessarily in the narrative part, but in the walking out, I was able to say, you know, here's some historical misunderstandings about Mm -hmm. uh, these women. Um, So it's, it's twofold. And I think they're just normal human beings and they are misunderstood in the way that we're misunderstood. We're, um, 
maybe we are misunderstood in the in the fact that we may have been one way before we met Jesus or even in our early part of our walk with him and now we're another way but we're still being judged for what we were in the past you see that with Rahab the harlot i mean everywhere she goes she has the harlot added to the yeah. end of her name i just probably wouldn't like to be mary the harlot for the rest yeah. of my life um mary magdalene had a bit of that too that's often in the biblical narrative the woman that was you know demonized and uh, so we, we do have that kind of misunderstanding. And then we have a lot of misunderstanding on the Imago day of a human being. So when someone is trafficked, when someone is sexually abused, when someone is harmed, it's that somebody else has forgotten or chosen to forget that that person has the very stamp of God upon them. Mm-hmm. And when you're misunderstood in your human- humanity, all sorts of abuse can happen. Is there anything like you see regularly when people are talking about these women that you want to say, Hey, I think maybe in our more modern context, we have some misunderstandings of these women. Yes, definitely. Um, I think I'll go back to hearing sermons. I think Eve is constantly blamed solely for the fall and we just don't read, even though it's right there in the scripture that Adam's standing next to her and saying Mm -hmm. nothing. And so, and that scripture blames Adam, like throughout, you know, we see the first Adam, second Adam, we, we hear about the fall of, of mankind. And, and so it's, it's ironic. And then of course, Bathsheba, who, you know, if I hear another sermon where someone says, well, you know, David was an adulterer. I'm like, well, that would not be adultery because that is an abuse of power. And he harmed her and took from her. He, she was another man's wife. Yes, but she was not a willing participant in the yeah. quote unquote adultery, nor was she some temptress on a roof trying to seduce the king. Um, the, I mean, that's conjecture and it's not in the yeah. biblical narrative. And so that's where I get kind of frustrated with just read your Bibles, <laughs> read it plain yeah. and boring and ask questions and quit trying to add in what you've always heard. Cause I think we just tend to gloss over Bible stories with the sermons we've already heard without asking critical and good, important questions. Or we read into it our own, our own experience, our own, our own context. And that, that is a really easy way to misunderstand somebody Mm -hmm. else. We're reading something into it that isn't said there. Can you relate to one of these women more than another? Is there a favorite? Um, I really, there's a couple, I think. Um, I relate to Tamar. She's, it's the Tamar who's violated, um, who's raped. And as a sexual abuse survivor, I really appreciate that her story is in the Bible because it doesn't have a strong resolution. And I think that's realistic in the, in the sense of when we've been traumatized by that, there's no like, oh, I'm at the end of my story now and I'm great. There's always this journey of healing that you're walking through. So I just appreciate that she's there. It makes me feel not so crazy and alone. And then I really love Phoebe because most people don't even know who she is, but she's most likely, according to many scholars, the person who took the book of Romans to Rome. And she had this like quiet, Im- deeply important mission. Um, and I think a lot of people just misunderstand this beautiful, amazing deaconess who ha- must have been on a very perilous journey to get um, that letter to the into the right hands. I think that there is a stereotype about Christianity from people either who've had bad experiences or who don't know that would say, you know what? Christians don't value women. And how would you, how would you respond to that? It's a misunderstanding, but it's actually well founded throughout history. So that's the the hard thing is that I think true Jesus loving Christ followers understand that there's neither Jew nor Greek, male nor female, slave or free. We're all level at the playing field of the cross. Um, But there have been some very misogynistic um, theologies and uh, people throughout the centuries, as well as there's been non-misogynistic theologies and scholars. So we have to kind of look at the whole context. But if we just go back to Jesus and we look at how he interacted with women, it's revolutionary. And um, all I have to do is just ask myself the question, is this how Jesus would treat a woman? And if the question, if the answer is no, then I can speak up for women who are being marginalized by the church because it's not how Jesus would have responded. Any abuse or misogyny you see, you would say is a subversion of the, the good news of Jesus. 
Yeah, it, it if you if you can answer the question, would Jesus do this? And, and the answer is no, then yeah, it doesn't represent it. I love how I see you like interact with people in your speaking and your writing and like your social media presence is so very encouraging and very championing, championing and championing, championing, <laughs> championing of people that I have seen be misunderstood. I, I am very, very grateful for that. Is that something you've had to work at? Uh, no, there's something inside of me that rises up that I can't kind of help myself. I kind of have to pull myself back. There's this like prophetic side of me that um, if I see someone being harmed because I was harmed and not helped as a child, I feel like it's up to me to make sure no one has to go through that again because it hurts so much. Um, so it's it's an instinct. It just happens. You're a, a woman, obviously. I am. Your book is about women. Are men going to benefit for, from this book? Is this a book for women? What's your answer to that? Um, no, it's a book for men and women. And um, I think both benefit just as as well, uh, because I think a lot of human beings have misinterpreted these stories. And not that I'm like number one scholar, I'm I'm not a scholar, but I do bring to the table that plain reading and constant reading of scripture over and over and over again. Like I said, doing these rapid reads over the past couple of years has done miracles in my relationship with Jesus. And so one of my takeaways of this book is that people would fall in love with the word of God and um, that they would know that they're not alone in being misunderstood. And I didn't get the impression that it was a specially stereotypically feminine book when I read it. Um, But I did, I love that at the end of the chapters, there is like a way to engage, engage with the material. So it's written in such a way you really can easily work through this in community. Mm -hmm. Is that what you envision as you, as you, as you yes. It. And on my launch team right now, a lot of people are saying, hey, I'm going to recommend this as our next Bible study. So I, that makes me really happy because there are a lot of like really dig deep Bible studies and I think they're great. But this would be kind of a friendly one. You read a chapter and come and ask, answer the questions together. It's um, pretty easy to do. And I think it's very unique. And you're looking at at these women from a completely different perspective. I surveyed my listeners uh, earlier this year and also last last summer, and a good number of them have experienced some sort of spiritual abuse mm-hmm. or been hurt in their faith communities, um, understand being mm-hmm. misunderstood. And I just would love to hear what kind of encouragement you could offer them. Yeah, first, I just empathize deeply. And I'm so sorry that that happened to you. And I wish that it didn't. And I wish that the church was a safe place for people who follow Jesus. And sometimes it's not. And uh, we're working on bringing that to light. And, you know, I I hope and pray that uh, eventually you will find safe and good community because the Lord, when we're injured with a community injury, we have to heal with a community healing. And that means you may need to leave your Um, place of origin and find a different body of people who are safe um, in order to do that. But we cannot heal in isolation. And I think that's frustrating, just to be honest, because I would rather just like, oh, I've been hurt. I'm going to isolate. I don't want humans in my life anymore. But the truth of the matter is, is that a relational wound requires a relational healing. And so my prayer, first of all, is that there would be that journey of forgiveness and letting go of bitterness in its own time. It takes time not to rush it. But second, just that you'd be willing to, as you have the strength and ability to step into a safe place to be prayed for and healed. When we first talked uh, on my very first podcast episode, Mary was the very first person to say yes to me and to come on. You told a story that I would love if you would be willing to share again. And I think you had finished up your, a time of overseas a painful time in your life and you were coming home. And this is sort of a way that um, demonstrated that being healed in community during a time where you're like, I don't know. I don't know if I really want to be with community. Could you tell us that story again? Because I know I have many people that have not heard it yet. Absolutely. So we were church planters in France, Southern France for almost three years. And we experienced that um, 
basically spiritual abuse as well. And uh, I had made a decision as we were going home for good to Texas that I wasn't going to entrust my heart to Christian leaders again. I was really upset and I was kind of folding my arms across my chest as I was flying home. And, and I, and I really didn't want, I didn't even trust Christians. I was just like, this is just that we had so much trauma. I just couldn't even think straight. And we landed and we didn't even have keys. We didn't have, we had suitcases, no car. We had to borrow a car and we got, we were fighting on the way to try to find this ranch where we were going to live in the corner of a barn um, about a week before Christmas. And my name being Mary was kind of funny. Like, you know, I just felt like I was part of a nativity <laughs> scene or something. And uh, so we get there and um, there's there are lights strung up on the corner of this barn. And we walk into this little two bedroom apartment that us and our three kids would be in. And there was I was thinking we weren't even going to have Christmas because we were so broken and sad and tired and I didn't even have any energy. But in the little barn, there was a Christmas tree. There was cookies on the table. All of our beds were made. The pantry was stocked. The fridge was stocked. There was music playing and our friends were there welcoming us back. And I really felt like the Lord said, are you going to take a leap? (laughs) Are you going to entrust yourself to these safe people? And, you know, there were fits and starts. It wasn't like I just jumped right back into community because it was so much pain. But those folks, those those people from my church and friends, they loved me back to health. And I, I could clearly see the decision before me. And um, I could have kept my arms across my chest and said, nope, not doing that. It's too painful. But through tentative steps of trust, uh, the Lord brought healing to all of us through our relationships. How long did it take for you to feel like, I feel like I can trust? Or are you still sort of walking that dance back and forth a little bit? I think for everybody, it's different. Probably about two years of wrestling um, for me. I think it took my husband longer. And um, I think we're all in just different journeys. So it's kind of just hard to say. But And I think it depends on the trustworthiness of the existing relationships that you have. So I had some really good friends who were long-term friends that I knew that I knew that I knew that I could trust them. And so that helped as well. Yeah. I don't want to put you on the spot, but you don't have to answer any question that you don't feel like answering, but you have been a part of the SBC for a long time, right? And like, there's been a lot of interesting happenings. Like (laughs) there's been some good moves and some, some like heartbreaking things too. Um, What, where is your heart there and, and what encouraging things do you see and whatever you feel comfortable sharing in regard to that. And I think it kind of speaks to the whole trust issue as well. Um, How you have navigated your space in a place that is, is struggling in some ways, like many denominations or or like movements. I know, I don't know if SBC is considered a, it's a, it's a cooperation of Mm -hmm, churches. mm -hmm. I love to hear personally, like how, how you have, you've worked through that. If you feel comfortable sharing. So I didn't grow up in a church, and so I don't really have any like long history with the SBC. The church that we do go to now, we've gone to since 2000. And when I wrote the book We Too um, and was asked to pray at the SBC convention in Birmingham, Alabama, I had to call my church, and I was like, um, I have to be a messenger. And they're like, oh, my gosh, we haven't sent someone to the SBC since 1985. <laughs> so, so this shows like how loosely affiliated our church is with the SBC. And, um, and so that in that sense, I didn't have like a huge long personal link, which gave me some good editorial distance and maybe a prophetic distance to be able to speak to it, um, kind of as an outsider, so to speak. Um, but I had to take a four month sabbatical after all of that stuff went down with just being a part of that meeting and the Caring Well Conference. I realized something important about myself. Um, I do like to say prophetic things, but I'm not built for politics. And I just cannot, I cannot get in the middle of it. It just kills my soul. And so um, I can minister to people, I can speak, I can do all of that, but I'm just not good in like policy and, 
and because there's just so much like ire directed your way and it just I couldn't weather it. It was just too many, too many things, too hard. Most of the leaders were very kind to me, but there were a few um either on the periphery or within that were it was just rough. And talk about being misunderstood, completely misunderstood. Mary, you wear a lot of different hats. Would you be willing to tell us all the things you've been working on and what you've been up to? Oh my gosh. <laughs> this has become a therapy session. So uh, I have way too many hats and I've always tried to take some off, but for whatever reason, this is just how it is. And so yes, author of 44 books now, um, I am a speaker. I was a speaker longer than I've been an author, um, a literary agent where I acquire books to be um, acquired by big publishing houses. Uh, that's probably my biggest job right now in terms of time. Uh, artist, an Etsy artist. And um, what else do I do? Oh, and a podcaster. So I do pray every day, which is a uh, uh, pray through the Bible verse by verse, five minutes a day. And we just are passing 2.7 million downloads on that. So that's been an amazing, crazy, wild journey. That is a lot of downloads. Um, are your downloads all from the United States or are they from all over? Almost every country of the world, except for more closed ones like North Korea and Eritrea and Afghanistan. Um, but most countries have it there. And um, so 153 countries, I think, something like that. Um, so I don't know how it gets out there, but I'm just super grateful that uh, that I get to pray for people every single day. And it's really encouraging um, because when I'm praying, I sometimes will sense the Holy Spirit say something like, there's someone in your audience today who wants to kill themselves. And so I will say, don't kill yourself. It's important that you stay on this earth. We need you. We need your voice. And then I pray for them. And you know, there was one time the Lord said, talk about horses. I was like, horses? That's weird. And I actually did get an email about it. And they were like, I can't believe you talked about horses because that's exactly what I needed to hear. Like, of all those things that you do, Mary, what is the one thing that energizes you the most? Actually, it's one-on-one uh, -on -one praying for people and seeing the Holy Spirit illuminate something that they need and that I didn't know that they needed. So what kind of feedback are you getting from your launch team? Yeah, it's been really fun. The launch team's been great. And uh, they have resonated with each woman in different ways. I was surprised, I think, by how many people related to Naomi because she has so much grief. And I think it makes sense now that I think about it because we've walked through a season of long-term grief as a nation and as a world. Um, so it, it makes sense that we would resonate with Naomi, but that did surprise me a little bit. What is your greatest hope for this book? I would say that people would walk away from it with a love of the scripture and kind of a rejuvenation of their perspective on the, the living and active word of God. And then second, that they would understand that it's not their job to micromanage their reputation, but that they can entrust it to the Lord. And he is the best PR person in the world. And sometimes it means that we need to be quiet. That doesn't mean that we don't speak up and tell the truth. That's why I hate to have these like hard and fast rules because the Holy Spirit will tell you there's times when you need to speak up. And there, then there'll be times where you need to be silent. And we can only just look at the life of Jesus for that. Sometimes he was very clear. He spoke up. He told the truth. There's other times that he was silent. And that's why it's so important we stay close to the Spirit. I'm so glad you mentioned that part about speaking up or being silent. Mm -hmm. So how, how do we discern what to do, whether we speak or don't speak? I know. I wish I could... Yeah, I wish I could answer that question. I do think it's a case by case basis. And I do believe the Holy Spirit will give us that insight when we need to. I think for me, if I've, I think the kind of the indication for me is if I feel like this frenetic fear building up inside of me, like, oh my gosh, someone doesn't like me and I got to go make sure they like me, then I know that it's time to be silent because then I'm in my own strength trying to do something. But if it's usually, if, if it's something that needs to be clarified about the gospel or the truth, um, I have no qualms about speaking up about those kinds of things, um, especially if there's misunderstanding of the gospel and, and of who Jesus is. So I guess it doesn't have to relate to me, but I, I feel that compelling, you know, heart to 
say, actually, no, that's not how Jesus would have acted in that. Just look at this passage of scripture and you can see. This is where I kind of land on this. I feel like when we're misunderstood, there's just some icky stuff going on and I feel like the enemy gets like a wedge in there. And I think he wins twice when we not only are hurt, but then we spend a lot of time in our heads thinking through this situation because then we are brought to inaction. And this is the thing that I learned from my own grave mistake is that when I was misunderstood by my friend, it occupied my head so much that I wasn't moving forward with the next great things that God called me to do. And so if we're in that ruminating phase and just thinking, why did that happen? And what could I do? And how can I manage my reputation? It's like this cycle of thought that prevents you from hearing the voice of God and prevents you from taking the next right step. What would you say to somebody who wants to get back into Bible reading, or maybe they haven't ever done it, um, or they just sort of want to get a jump start on their Bible reading time. Any advice for them? Well, I would just challenge people to do a rapid read. So take the number of pages in your Bible divided by how many days you want to read it. So like, let's say 90 days or 120 days. And that's how many pages you read per day. So it could be, any, be anywhere from like 15 to 30 pages a day. And you have the time. You're just not, you're just on your phone. <laughs> so get off your phone, read it. And Ouch. I think it will... I know. Well, I'm saying it to myself as I'm on my phone a lot. Um, but you can do that and it will change the way you look at scripture completely because it will, you will make, uh, connections you've never made before. Um, so that for that, I think is really helpful. If you can pray out loud, something I did this morning, really changed my day. I woke up, I'd had a nightmare. It was a horrible dream. I was in a really bad mood and sad and scared and all those things. And I just thought, okay, I, I got to get out of this. And so I took, picked up my phone and I looked at my messages and I just started recording prayers for every person that I had messaged in the past like month and a half. Uh, like 30 seconds to a minute. And it was like the most invigorating, joyful, surprising thing for them and joyful thing for me. And so if you want to grow in your joy of prayer, pray for other people, record those prayers and send them to them, you will change their lives. Is there anything else you wanted to share about your book or that you would want people to know? You know, just that, um, again, I think I mentioned this earlier, but that these women in the word of God are actual living, breathing human beings who had desires and fears just like us. And that's why it's so important we learn from them because they were, they're not just um, a character on a page. They're actual, they represent actual human beings. And that, that's where I just, that's where the Bible comes alive for me. Thanks for listening, friends. If you have thoughts on anything we've talked about today, I'd love to hear from you on Instagram or Facebook. You can find me by searching for Untangled Faith. I'm also on Twitter as Faith Untangled. This podcast is made possible by the support of the Untangled Faith Patreon community. Check out patreon.com slash untangled faith to learn more about how you can join in. See you back here next week.